Good afternoon, everyone, uh, both to the in-person uh, people who are attending, as well as the online attendees. My name is Sivue Bangani, and I'm the Director of Research Services in the Library. Uh, my task today is really a very easy one. Uh, it is just to introduce all the important people that are going to actually do the speaking here. Um, on the agenda today, we'll have Ms. Tice, Ms. Ellen Tice, um, who is the Senior Director, Library and Information Service, and she will officially welcome you to this 11th Annual Library Research Week. She will be followed by Professor Sibusi Somoyo, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Stellenbosch University, Research, Innovation, and Postgraduate Studies. That's the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research, Innovation, and Postgraduate Studies, who will officially open the Library Research Week in 2023. This will be followed by a panel discussion, and of course, there will be a word of thanks um, thereafter, some of the in-person guests will be invited to join us for a reception in the library staff room. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Tice to the stage. Immediately thereafter, it will be Professor Moyo. Uh, Professor Moyo will not read your biography, so you'll just come and speak <laughs> to officially open the Library Research Week. Thank you so much. Uh, and just for those of you who don't know yet, he's graduating next week uh, with his PhD from UNISA. Wow. So um, I, I was a little bit worried when he said I should come to the, forward to the stage and that you need to welcome me. It sort of felt like, you know, the Oscar Awards. <laughs> but um, good, good afternoon. Um, indeed, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the launch of our 11th uh, Stellenbosch University Library Research Week. Um, and if you, those of you who are good with maths uh, would then realize that our first week was held in 2013, every year since then, including also during the COVID pandemic. And over the years, um, the attendance had actually really grown. Um, when we started, in fact, the, uh, prior to COVID-19, um, uh, to COVID uh, when we only held this event in person, uh, in 2019, the total uh, registrations for the whole week, for all the various sessions, including the launch, totaled 363. In 2020, uh, it was 812, because then, of course, we held it completely virtual. In, 1990, uh, in 2021, it had grown to 992, and in 2022, there was a slight drop again to around in the 800s. Um, and this year, this morning, we already learned that we have over 2,000 registrations uh, for the week. So, so Library Research Week is a flagship event where we cater to researchers, academics, and postgraduate students. Our vision is to establish this event as a premier pl platform that invites partners from other academic support units, faculties, uh, to share knowledge, enhance research skills, and foster development. It is, one, it is one of many ways that the library contributes to the university's overarching theme of research for impact. Now, Saviwe had actually um, uh, uh, written a speech for me, and in line with the theme of this afternoon, he had asked ChatGPT uh, to write this welcome speech to you. And if I had actually followed ChatGPT, then I would have done the following, because this is, and I'll just read to you the first two paragraphs, what it did say I should do. Um, which is actually the most important part. Ladies and gentlemen, scholars and researchers, distinguished guests and avid learners, welcome to our Library Research Week. I also extend a warm 
welcome to Professor Moyo, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies. It is with great pleasure and excitement that I welcome you to this remarkable event. <laughs> in, in the pursuit of knowledge, the library serves as a beacon of wisdom, a sanctuary for curious minds, and a gateway to boundless possibilities. As we gather here, we embark on a collective journey to unlock the hidden potential within our research endeavors. This week is dedicated to nurturing the growth of your academic pursuits, equipping you with the tools and resources needed to excel in your scholarly endeavors. Amen. <laughs> with that, welcome, and I hope you will enjoy the next hour with us. Over to you, Professor Moyo. <laughs> Uh, we need to clap for Ellen again. I think that was very good. <laughs> I thought I was the only one who cheated, so I also used GTP, uh, G chat GPT for the same thing, so, but I'll tell you what my speech is like at the end, right? What I used it for. So yeah, so thank you so much for, you know, for coming. I really want to thank you, and I want to thank in particular the library for organizing uh, this session. Uh, which helps us really to come together and to celebrate um, you know, the different things that the library offers in our institution as part of creating an enabling environment. So before I start, maybe I should make acknowledgments to acknowledge uh, the panelists, first of all. I, I should start off with my boss, because then that becomes a problem, Ms. Ellen Tice, of course. And I've got another boss who's here. Uh, Ms. Ellen Tice is the director of the library. And then I've got Professor Jackie Dutuel, who's sitting here. The, um, you can just raise your hand so people know. Uh, she's uh, the main implementer of the uh, Future Professors Program. And I've been, I'm delighted that she's here, because also we want to showcase you know, resources that are there for Imaging researchers. Um, and then I invited my personal assistant who's acting for the moment, Natalie, who's here as well. And um, she was very nervous. But I think I said to her, you know, the, our peers, they work very hard, but they never come to any of the events. So usually they don't know what we are doing. I think they just think we make them busy. So I thought, no, you should come and see. And uh, so, yeah, so I acknowledge, um, and then I should also acknowledge our panelists who are with us today. Um, oh, yeah, Sibiwa, congratulations in advance, first of all, for the PhD, in case you become my future boss. So I should <laughs> just get that out of the way as well. And then go to <laughs> our panelists, um, Professors Michael uh, Daramola. Where's Michael? Michael Taramola, it's not, oh, online. Thank you to our online colleagues. Um, and then we've got Professor Dion Foster. Dion, yeah, there, and uh, from theology as well. So we are very fortunate as one of the universities that have the theology faculty. They always pray for us. That's why we don't have so much trouble, uh, if you want to know. And Mr. Lennox, uh, Olivia, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And then I've got uh, Mr. Walter uh, Clark who's with us as well. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us, colleagues. And then we've got staff, students. We've got the president of the SRC, where is she, over there? Yeah, our future boss as well, yeah? Yeah, thank you so much for joining us as well. And then, uh, so what I just wanted to say, maybe starting off by, um, you know, the university's vision 2040, um, which says that, you know, Stellenbosch University will be Africa's leading research intensive university that is globally recognized as excellent, inclusive, innovative, where we advance knowledge in service of society. Um, for me, I think it's very more important for us to think what this mission means and the role that the library plays. And I believe that you know the research we can, the type of resources that we have, uh, help us to actually be inclusive and and to break the uh, the boundaries. Whether you are you know the class that you come from, you have access to the resources. It's not dependent on the class um, that you come from, or whether you have enough money to have access to those resources in terms of the knowledge uh, that we want everyone to have access to. So in terms of our mission, we also say that uh, the university is a research-intensive university uh, where we attract outstanding students, employ talented staff like all of you, and provide a world-class environment 
and, and I think I underline world-class environment, uh, a place connected to the world while enriching and transforming local, continental, and global communities. And I know most of you have heard this several times, but I think when we talk about the library, the issue around environment is important. So providing a world-class environment, what does that mean, connected to the world? So this week we connect, uh, we, we run through a number of um, events, people tell us what they're doing, um, but for us it's also enriching and makes sure that we, uh, for the students and the staff that we support, that they have access to information to enable them get skills, to enable them share knowledge, and to enable them also innovate, um, as I will be able to demonstrate just now. So for the library, the mission and vision, which I should remind all of us, uh, centers on six objectives. So you remember that last year we also had, through the leadership of the director, the um, institutional review of the library, which was done by external uh, stakeholders. And in that, we, we focus on six areas. The first one is really uh, being responsive, transformative, and inclusive in terms of the service that we offer as a library. So here I want to emphasize cyber.com, for example, which is one of the tools that helps us to evaluate the research that we do. It also helps us to equalize the play field, playing field. Um, uh, for everyone that has access to it. It's a free resource. There are other available resources to our students, uh, the books, e-books, which are also quite expensive, but we know through the library, if you can have access to that, uh, then you don't really need to find additional resources. And we know with the dwindling allowances that um, don't cover the expenses that everyone needs. Um, and then also we know that uh, the other area that we focus on is ensuring that we provide optimal access to re, uh, responsive collections. And, and, and this is quite interesting, I mean, to break it down what that means. Um, the other area we focus on is smart technologies which enable a digital first class library service. Um, and um, we know that we are world class currently because that's what our, our evaluators said. You know, there are many people who say to themselves, like, I'm excellent, I'm world class. And the question is, how do you know that you're world class? But from the evaluations we've got from um, last year, for example, from this independent panel, they also agreed that this was a world class library in terms of the resources that we offer. So I really want to thank the staff um, and the university who make sure that our resources are world class. And that's why we also have world class researchers. And uh, by world class, uh, and I look to our SRC president, world class students. Uh, she's a very good student, by the way. I think if we just, uh, and then uh, that comes from also having access to information, despite what the background one may come from. Yeah? Um, and we know that there's been a recent, you know, a number of movement, movements around open access, you know, open science, uh, trying to make sure that everybody can have equitable share of those resources. Um, the other part we focus on is leadership in digital scholarship and research support. We know that we lead and others follow within the sector. And our director for the library, for example, sits on the national panel, which negotiates some of, some of the deals that we end up with uh, in terms of um, um, the, the, uh, the resources that are required. Um, and then a focus on internal and external partnerships. And for us, this is important. Today, for example, the library has shown a good example of how we can collaborate internally and externally. Uh, we are, we, we've been trying to break those boundaries from the research area in terms of making sure that we have interdisciplinary research transdisciplinary research that can be applied also in terms of the problems we face in our community. Um, working beyond boundaries, it's not very easy, but I think through this research week, you see that the library went out of its comfort zone, as it normally does, to make sure that different stakeholders participate, because we know that with diversity, um, and we get rich data, rich resources, and we all uh, tend to produce better results in any case. Um, and then the last one, of course, uh, we can't have the library if we didn't have comp competent, diverse, and agile staff. Like you can see our doctorate in, in front, the new competent uh, diversity. We, we cover all those areas. So I just want, again, to congratulate the library, um, as I said. Um, 
And then, of course, like every other student these days, I decided to put my speech in ChatGPT to see what it would say. And so now I'm going to read you the real speech <laughs> from ChatGPT. And it said the following. So I said, can you help me you know, prepare speech today because I was rushing and had so many meetings for today. So it said the following. Um, I said, uh, the theme for the, for the library today was uh, you know, to help power up your research pathway. That was the theme, right? So under that, it says the following, and this will be very valuable, I guess, for startup researchers, emerging researchers as well. It says, number one, set clear research goals before you start any research project. It's essential to have a clear idea of what you want to achieve. Define your research questions, objectives, and make a plan of how you will reach them. Okay, so that was point number one. Uh, you always have to check what ChatGPT tells you. I think this point is true in terms of the theme, which is about powering up your research. Okay, the second point it says, use reliable, uh, reliable sources. And this is where it becomes important, I think, the role that the library plays. Ensure that the sources you use for research are reliable and authoritative. Use academic journals, peer-reviewed articles, reputable websites, and books written by experts in the field. So it's not saying use me, chat GPT, right? Uh, the third one is um, organization is key. Keep your notes and research organized and accessible. Use a reference management uh, software to manage your references and citations and create a clear, concise outline of your research project. We know that one of the things we've been dealing with, with strategically is around research data management, which has also been a key issue. Uh, and for many researchers, it's an area which we need to keep um, pay attention to. Most journals, when you publish these days, they also want to know how the data will be stored. And then the second last point it says collaborate with peers. And I liked this one because collaboration is key. It's always helpful to discuss your research project with peers and get feedback and suggestions from others. Collaborating with researchers can also help you broaden your perspective and approach your research from different angles. And the last one it says stay focused. It's easy to get sidetracked. Right? And I think, well, that point is true. Uh, I mean, you can get sidetracked by falling in love or, um, you know, patting too much, I always say to our students, especially here. So, um, but I thought that point was relevant. But in any case, um, with those points uh, which came from Chad GPT, I thought they were a bit relevant. But just to say to all our organizers once again, um, for this week, I wish you a productive week. Of course, for us, it's important for us to continue uh, carrying on the research momentum. Publish, publish, or perish is still part of the game, even though people say, Publish, but we are doing research for impact. Research for impact is about storytelling. And I hope that this week we'll be able to tell a lot of stories and profile those stories as well. So yes, to Ellen and the team and all our colleagues online and our panelists, I look forward to listening to you. And welcome once again. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Oh, by the way, there's one part I forgot. So uh, formally, we hereby, you can stand up on your side. We formally launched the library week, right? So can we all clap for that part? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mayo. Um, I, I think Ms. Tice forgot the other part when I sent her the speech. Uh, I did say that this thing will make us to be lazy thinkers uh, because we will always run to it. And, and thank you so much for setting you know, the scene uh, in such you know, a good manner, in such a beautiful manner. Um, now, and I must also thank you, uh, Ms. Tice, for welcoming everybody uh, to this launch. Uh, now we'll move on to the panel discussion, which will be facilitated by Professor Bruce Watson. Um, he is the director of the center for Artificial Intelligence Research at the School for Data Science and Computational Thinking uh, here at Stellenbosch. Um, all our panelists are highly esteemed, but in the interest of time, I will, only, I will not read their biographies, their full biographies, but I think I will read you know, part of uh, Professor Daramola's biography uh, because he's an external guest. He's the only external you know, panelist uh, among this group. Um, Professor Michael Daromola is, uh, is 
sorry, um, he's the head of Department of Chemical Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and Information Technology at the University of, Tech, uh, University of Pretoria. He's also a professor, um, a visiting professor at the University of the Witwatersrand and an honorary professor at UKZN, uh, of course, in South Africa. He's a registered chartered chemical engineer with the Engineering Council of UK, a registered engineer with the Council for Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria, and he's an NRF C rated researcher. The second panelist will be Professor Dion A. Foster. Uh, from Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology at the Faculty of Theology. Uh, I just want to add that uh, Professor Foster completed his first uh, PhD titled Validation of Individual Consciousness in Strong Artificial Intelligence, and that was in 2006. Yeah, this shows that uh, AI is not something new, but it's just that its development has accelerated in the past few years. Uh, the, the third panelist will be Mr. Lennox Olivier. He is the current, currently is the advisor, higher education, learning technology, and program renewal at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. The fourth one will be Mr. Wouter Klopvik. He is the library's own director of information technology services. Uh, before I hand over to Professor Bruce Watson, who's joining us online, and also Professor Taromola, is joining us online. I would like to invite the in-person panelists to just come in front here and sit. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. They are now uh, elicited. Prof. Bruce Watson, over to you. Yes, uh, Bruce, thank you very much, and uh, colleagues, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Um, I think artificial intelligence presents us with uh, a number of wonderful possibilities. We've seen in the two very excellent speeches we heard this afternoon uh, that there are certainly some opportunities, but also 
but there are some very deep challenges uh, when it comes to these large uh, language learning models. And of course, when artificial intelligence gets integrated into other forms of uh, not only knowledge production, but other forms of uh, engaging in, in tasks that relate uh, to generative uh, activities that tend to be associated with humans, um, we might see some further challenges. But, um, you know, the title of today's uh, talk uh, interested me quite a bit. Uh, a saviour or a monster in our midst. Now, I'm sure they included the word saviour there because I'm from uh, theology. Now, the one thing that I can give you absolute certainty on is that artificial intelligence cannot save us. Um, it might be able to help us uh, in some ways, and I think that, that there are some, some great promises in that. But certainly for those of us who are engaged in the academic pursuit for knowledge and uh, this concept that we call truth, um, one of the things that we do need to recognize is that very often truth requires a measure of careful, critical engagement. So I, I, I engaged in a little activity uh, for today with ChatGPT, um, and I asked ChatGPT a very simple question in, in three languages uh, that, that I know relatively well, in English, uh, in Isikosa and in German, um, I asked it the question, will there be dogs in heaven? Now, what do you think? Will there be dogs in heaven? <laughs> now, what was interesting was that ChatGPT gave its usual sort of uh, wishy-washy answer. You could see it had surveyed a number of academic articles, it had found a number of uh, beautiful memes about puppies on the internet, and gave a sort of answer that was non-committal, uh, but tried to sort of sketch uh, the general idea. Now, that's not surprising. I think any of us as academics, if we read that in our student papers, we'll immediately be able to pick it up. For me, the issue was, however, when I read the Isikosa and the German answers, what I found was that because this is a language learning model, ChatGPT assumes that there is one normative language in the world, and that is American English. So in effect, what ChatGPT did was it didn't take any account of the fact that in Amatosa tradition, dogs are regarded very differently to how they are regarded, for example, in Germany or in American uh, cultures. And the role that animals play in social life wasn't taken into context. So I think that illustrates for us one of the complexities that we need to have um, when it comes to using these large language learning models um, in our research. They, they offer us some uh, promise, but they also offer us some real challenges. And of course, you know, if we get a chance to talk about this a little bit later, we can ask some questions about who programs these models. Uh, you know, what, what gender are the persons who program these? Where do they sit in the world? Uh, are they white and male like me? Or do they represent, uh, for example, young black women uh, in, in their programming? So I think these are some of the, the important questions that we might ask uh, to start us off with. Thanks, Bruce.
these critical thinking abilities <coughs> and skills with which they will have to fight or to contribute to this uh, knowledge economy. And another thing that is quite very important feature in the elective first council mentioned uh, when he gave our speech is about reason. <coughs> you know, when you are doing research, you know, there are things that are quite very difficult for you to or understand or be able to gather when you are being a tutorial reader. And that thing would be the knowledge gap in the field. And that's one of uh, my experiences. Uh, most of students, most of other researchers, these are really very difficult things for them. And uh, not only that, people that are able to identify what you are uh, conceptualize those gaps to be able to formulate very good and insight questions upon which you develop your objectives. And uh, from my interaction in the chat GPT, the chat GPT will guide you to come up with very good research questions based on the uh, opportunities or what has been done before in terms of the gaps in the field. And with that, it will guide researchers, maybe any career researchers that are able to understand where to go. And another thing that is quite very important maybe when it comes to teaching and learning is that um, with the advent of AI, artificial intelligence, it makes education possible at any time, at any way. And not only that, it makes this kind of mentorship, you know, virtual and very possible. People have been doing that, uh, so that we also are seen globally. And that's one, that's one of the things that I would say that for well, AI has that kind of capability to assist us to transform the way we teach, to transform the way we do research. Uh, we have not compromised the point, although there are ethical issues, which I believe the other colleagues that we also now mention as we proceed uh, with this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Michael, thanks very much. Very much appreciate it. Also, the enthusiastic uh, viewpoint, which uh, goes along very well with the odds that involve the ethical guardrails as well. So, I'd like to move on now just uh, a couple of minutes each from Lennox and from Walter, if I have just a moment. And uh, if you come from a uh, somewhat related background, we'll start with you, Lennox, and just have to give us an overview of what you think the implications of artificial intelligence is, in particular, this kind of artificial intelligence are. Um, okay, thank you very much. I'm really honored to, to be here among such, a, um, you know, can I say, amazing panel. Um, I feel a little bit uh, like I'm at the other end of things. I'm working every day in the arts faculty with lecturers who are really, really struggling with huge problems caused by uh, ChatGPT and AI. And I would like to kind of a little bit more focus on that, uh, especially now that we're going into exams and um, ongoing assessment. Um, so ChatGPT did cause a lot of panic initially in January when, it, when we started this um, semester. Um, and particularly in undergraduate assessment uh, concerns. Um, in the social sciences specifically, prior to and specifically during lockdown, most people became, or lecturers became, completely dependent on what we call the take-home assignment, you know, or either essay or uh, like a kind of a research, mini-research assignment, and then a lot of, uh, you know, uh, multiple-choice questionnaires and so on that students could do from home. Um, prior to COVID, this was also a practice, obviously, but then people did it differently. And, um, but during COVID, obviously, people had to do it from home. So, um, something that became more popular, I would say, than over time was this mini research assignment, which gives students the opportunity to um, work from home and um, you know, get an opportunity to go back to the work that they covered in the module, apply the theory, um, to a real-world uh, engagement and then, you know, write up their experiences in an academic style of writing, you know, like an introduction to research papers. 
Um, so the students, op uh, lecturers often op opted for this because it's this, this is complete open book research type assignment and you didn't have to worry about people cheating when they're doing their tests online and so on. And it, I think it worked very well for a lot of lecturers. All of a sudden this year, um, look, there was concerns about tools online in the past. Um, paraphrasing tools like Coolbot and so on that you could ask it to translate, then you translate the translation back to English and all of that kind of things for students use these things to get past the Turnitin tool and so on, you know. But all of a sudden, beginning of the year, uh, you know, uh, ChatGPT was released as we all know. So um, the take home assignment seems to become something that we cannot do anymore at all. Uh, and this is a big concern for lecturers because what are they going to do now? I mean, the multiple choice questions are simply answered by ChatGPT, and this bot just writes text, you know, better than students can write it. <laughs> okay? Um, especially undergraduate, you know, we're talking now more, more specifically that. So, um, we had to suddenly figure out uh, the impact that this tool will have on our assessments, as we know it, our existing assessments. In other words, we were forced to reconsider all our assessment methods um, and explore how one could then, that was actually the, the, the most exciting bit, how could we use AI in our assessments or as part of it? Um, to conclude what happened in practice now, I think people were so overwhelmed coming out of COVID having to go online with everything they did in the past, face to face and in exam situations. They just managed to get everything online. Now they're suddenly thrown at the other end with a challenge offline. You can't do it online anymore. It's got to go back uh, to, to handwritten uh, tests, in-class tests and so on. I think most of them are still at this stage really in our faculty just struggling to overcome this challenge. Very few of them has even thought about how they could incorporate ChatGPT into their, uh, their assessments and into their research. That's, that's kind of what I think is happening. And the exam is still coming up now, where all of these new methods and ways that they're trying to do things are going to be implemented, which I think is a huge challenge. I mean, many of these students are sitting in third year. They never wrote something on paper with their hands for the last two years. All of a sudden, they're expected in an exam to write a 2,000 word assignment by hand without being able to cut and paste, without autocorrect grammar tools. And I'm telling you, it's not the easiest thing to mark either. It takes a lot of time. These practical uh, you know, uh, problems that, that lecturers are facing much more, I think, than we realize. So that's just the flip side, I think, uh, I mean, uh, of this amazing tool that our lecturers are struggling with. And I just wanted to open up with that and say that that's what we're dealing with most of the time right now in our faculty, uh, as opposed to all the amazing things that ChatGPT could possibly and will do in the future. Um, I think you, you ask uh, how does it all fit together, perhaps I should start with that, uh, especially in the library environment. Um, I think you can broadly think of AI in three classifications in a library environment, symbolic, connectionist and generative. Um, with, within a library environment, I, uh, it, it's, it's a bit different than, uh, than um, uh, educational in, 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 in the broad sense that libraries have been um, involved with AI since the past 10 years, I would, I would imagine about since 2013, some big libraries 
in the world started to experiment with, um, at that time, uh, symbolic AI methods like linked data and uh, knowledge representation. Um, and um, since then, since uh, shortly thereafter, I should just stand a bit back. Two mics. Um, shortly thereafter, um, we've had uh, a lot of connectionist AI. Here's the other one. No, that one's not on. Is that one on? No, it's not on. Um, there we go. We've, we've had a lot of connectionist AI, like machine learning, coming into the fold since 2012's breakthrough in back propagation. And we've seen that in image recognition, handwriting recognition, um, uh, metadata assignments, um, speeding up cataloging processes and classification, um, uh, machine learning methodologies, most of them supervised. Uh, so it's, 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 it's come to the fore in libraries to improve back, um, back, back office processes. Um, and as of late, also in more front-end systems like discovery tools and, and, and chat tools. Um, but to, just to get back to your, your answer, I think that the, the challenge is in going forward is that we now faced with a, a sort of a, like a third um, generation as such of AI, which is generative. Um, based on large language models and this is a new territory for libraries as well and I would imagine the, the challenges we sit with as libraries is to to feed these models the correct data to learn from uh, to use the technology to use the algorithm or the model as such to um, make our own collections more uh, uh, analytical and discoverable um, to make our collections uh, summative in a way that a student or a researcher can get a high level overview of what our collections are about through a tool like a generative AI tool without having to work through vast amounts of data to, to, do, that, to do that sort of sum, summation for you. Um, uh, ChatGPT has absolutely no idea what, you, what, you, what you're asking it. It, it has no context, it has no understanding of what you're asking. It's just simply a text or word prediction tool. And it has no idea what, what it's spitting out is the truth or not. So I think in a library environment, um, we, we wouldn't use it to try and make it a tool of discovery or a information source, but rather a tool to aid, um, to aid in like uh, summation tasks and um, making our collections more processable. Sorry, it's a bit of an echo. Yourself, because I was going to say, perhaps if you mute yourself, 
we might not have the, the challenge there is. That's all I'm being advised. Okay. Are there any questions from the online audience or in person audience? So it didn't say to whom was the question directed to. Uh, perhaps you know anybody can take it up. Uh, I think it was what are the implications for in I mean for turn it in. Uh, I think the, it wants to find out whether you know this can be picked up by turn it in. I think that was the the gist of the question basically. Okay, so. Um, in the beginning of the year, we didn't know where the Trinity was going to activate this uh, AI detector, and we had prom we were panicking a lot, I must say. And then we were uh, we, we had promises for it to be rolled out in in April, which it was towards the end of April. An AI detector tool was, I think, uh, not a full time, but it was like a test run, was uh, added to turn it in, where you could then get a percentage of and, and highlighted text of what part of the um, submission is considered to be AI generated. Um, Turnitin uh, gave the guarantee that it's very accurate, above 98%, I think, accuracy and so on. And then lecturers very quickly um, fell into a habit of using this AI detector almost exactly they would, as if they, like they would use Turnitin. Um, so, they started saying anything above 10 percent or you know 20 percent de detection or percentage would then be considered as ai generated and they would turn treat it very similar to 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 a plagiarism kind of situation with uh, turn it in but the problem with this is is that it's not quite the same and um it's it's a uh, very difficult uh to kind of confirm whether the student used it or not um, I don't want to say a lot more about that right now because uh, it's it's absolutely a, a, a something in progress that's happening right now. But what it means is, um, if it's a hundred, if it shows a hundred percent AI, the chances are almost guaranteed that it was that AI was used, either to transcribe it or to generate it from scratch. You don't know exactly know how it was used. The problem is that if students have a bit of savvy and they go online and they watch a few YouTube videos on how to do this, they can get that number down to zero with the two or three extra copy and pastes into different AI tools. So uh, you can f catch people using it, you can call them in, ask them to explain themselves and perhaps offer an opportunity to fix it and so on, see it as a training tool, which is fantastic. You know, it, it can be used like that. And most of the time students come clean and they learn from it and they don't do it again. But I think in the future, uh, I would highly recommend that in first year, we do a complete uh, course with students on what AI is, how it should be used and how it should not be used, when it becomes plagiarism, how to reference it, what kind of activities you can ask AI to do and what is completely, uh, you know, unethical. That should be done at first year level and they should be given activities to try out AI and so on. We did this in the third year module in sociology with Professor Lindy Heineken's module. She's the vice dean for, for research also in, in arts. And it seemed, seems to have worked very well, um, but it's in the beginning stage and I think lecturers should be encouraged. This is a great opportunity for research, actually this field is opening up for, for a lot of research opportunities as well uh, for lecturers to get involved in. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, um, Lennox. Thanks for that. So just, just to say um, th two things on this. The one is I, I serve on the Central Disciplinary Committee and I'm sure for the Vice Rector Teaching and Learning, <laughs> this is going to become an issue where we're going to have to think about policy. Um, and, you know, for those of us who have to evaluate um, what students produce, particularly undergraduate students, but I guess research students as well. Um, I can see the university is going to have to generate policy fairly quickly. There must be some models out there, but I think that's just something that we need to flag. Um, the other thing that I just want to mention is, you know, one of the ways in which I've been uh, dealing with this with my own students is to recognize that we have to be very, very cautious that we don't miss the opportunities that artificially intelligent uh, you know, uh, technologies offer us. 
Um, and one of the things that I think we need to learn as scholars, as researchers or, or teachers, is that, you know, there are two very sort of broad categories in which it, it can be used. The one is, is sort of consumptive. Um, AI is very good at gathering information about things. For example, I asked uh, Bing and ChatGPT to give me a summary of my own uh, doctoral thesis on artificial intelligence. I learned a thing or two, you know. It was not in the thesis. So, so in that sense, it, it you know it can gather information. It can try to represent it, um, and and it's not bad at doing that. I think the problem is, however, when it comes to research, we haven't yet figured out in what ways do we use artificial intelligence to become a generative tool. Uh, so, for example, you know, to generate new knowledge or insight. And and I think where it becomes particularly uh, challenging is for those of us in the humanities and to an extent the social sciences who are not trained uh, to deal with these kinds of technologies. So, uh, you know, these are things that I think we're going to have to think about because the reality is it's here to stay. It's finding a great use case. Our students are incredibly smart. We should give them points for that at evading, you know, turn it in and other things. But there are opportunities here that we can learn from. And maybe this is a, an opportunity for a little bit of reverse mentorship. Call that student in and say, teach me how to use this technology. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm also, uh, Prof. Uh, Daramola, if you want to add anything uh, from I mean, to yeah. this conversation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, something that I will have to eat uh, is this. We should understand that Chat GPT is a tool, it's one of the tools of AI, artificial intelligence. We've got in other tools that are quite very useful in research. For instance, if you are looking at artificial neural network, data analytics, or you are even con considering the programming language like Python that we use a lot in engineering, these are quite very useful when it comes to research so that we don't focus all our energy on chat GPT. There are other things that are quite very useful. But something, uh, the problem is this, no matter how useful these tools are, we have to understand that there are disadvantages or shortcomings that we need to understand. For instance, there might be issue of data bias because uh, this, especially these tools or chat GPT, an example of that, they are developed based on trained the data, a large data set, and which cannot, may not be replicated at times. And uh, another thing is that we do have a lack of control on uh, using some of these um, responses that have been generated, especially from chat GPT. And uh, in an, another case is now is that um, a situation where you, as a researcher, you need reproducibility of anything you've, you've done. And if you are concentrating only on using these uh, tools without validating using any other method, then you find yourself that uh, what you are producing as a researcher may not be creditable. And uh, that's why it is very important that when we are making use of that, we are teaching our students, we should rather use that um, chat GPT as a source of developing their critical thinking ability. Especially now, we should be able to use that one to develop their cognitive thinking ability. So that when you are doing your, uh, you are giving them a kind of uh, assessment or assignment, you should give it in such a way that they will not be able to even get the response or the answers from chat GPT. But something that they have to think about. But chat GPT may help, help them to develop that thinking because what you are giving to them is not what they can get uh, uh, answers to directly from the uh, chat GPT. And that one calls for us that as an institution or as a country, there is a need for us now to promote responsible use of AI technologies. So like, uh, you know, I also now I look into, you know, I ask chat GPT that what can we do to ensure that we have a responsible use of your yourself as a technology? then maybe it, it is now very important to for the country or even an institution, maybe like uh, Stellenbosch University, like other institutions now to look at um, uh, an institute within the institution to be, that will able now to promote 
the responsible use of AI technology. I think that one is what we need to look into. Apart from uh, governments now coming up with legislations, uh, regulations, and code of conduct of using AI technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, they want to clear first. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was very uh, interesting. Uh, Pro Prof Watson, uh, you want to say something? You are still the facilitator. <laughs> I'm, thanks, just, thanks. I'm just your mouth. That's, that's very kind of you, Sevira. You undersell yourself very much and uh, your uh, your additional facilitations most welcome. I think we're actually already at the, uh, the end of time. So, um, uh, and we've also heard uh, closing remarks from almost everyone. I think I'd like to just um, leave uh, one very last closing remark to Wouter, um, who's outside of my field of view on the camera. But I wonder if I could just ask a very provocative question that you have, uh, let's say 30 seconds to answer before we hand it back. And that is, um, to what extent do you see uh, AI and this kind of AI development as an existential threat for libraries as we know it? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. He's muted this time, isn't he? All oh, right, okay. Um, so, well, well, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 sometimes I do this and I shouldn't, but I should just correct you quickly, sorry, on something earlier. Um, um, I guess I'm getting in trouble for this, but um, a, a generative system um, is not really maintained or, or created by people who set parameters. It's it's all in the data you prepare and you feed it to determine whether you're going to, you're going to get bias in the data um, and, 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 and what is going to spit out. So um, it, it really does not get down to a lot of um, racial or gender equality when you prepare the, um, the algorithm as such. Um, and I, I, I make, I'm making this point because I think the, the challenge for libraries going forward with generative AI is to prepare the correct trustworthy data for a model to be used for certain projects and within certain collections. Um, and I don't see it as a um, as, as, as a, 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 a technology that is going to be challenging libraries uh, in, in that way. I see it as a technology that libraries can um, adapt very um, productively um, for various purposes, some of them to help us do summation of data. And, and to make data more discoverable. So um, I, I think it's still very early days where, where as libraries had a lot of experience in, in, in symbolic and, and, and connectionist AI, this is very much the, the beginning for, for generative AI in libraries. Um, but I see actually great potential for this. Um, and also I see it's, it's going to be necessary to, to amend copyright rules uh, or laws, at, at least within South Africa, um, to be able to make an a person who is using generative AI and who's put substantial effort into generating something with the tool to, to recognize that person as an author, where uh, currently um, you're only recognized as an author if it's, if it's more traditional work. So um, there's various facets um, um, of, of generative AI which apply to libraries going forward, and some of them are challenging and some of them are great opportunities. Sorry, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, Prof, I'm not taking over your role. Maybe we should also put the same questions to, I mean, question to the other uh, panelists, uh, because we know that, you know, this technology can do a bit of research, sometimes these technologies, and uh, maybe even a bit of teaching. <laughs> uh, maybe the same question should be put to Prof Daramore, for example, and uh, uh, Prof Foster. Indeed. Let's start uh, actually very briefly with uh, with you, Lennox, if you have a moment. Um, right. Sorry, Dion or Lennox, uh, whoever has the, the microphone, if you uh, would give us your half minute sound bite on that. Yes, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm hesitant to speak before Michael uh, because, as I say, I'm not an, an, an expert in, in this field. I mean, my 
uh, thoughts are more sort of theoretical um, around this. I mean, m my sense is that uh, humans have always had to figure out how we work with technologies. And um, in some senses, we can make the argument that, that most technologies are relatively neutral. I mean, you know, uh, we can think, for example, about, uh, you know, cars are relatively morally neutral, uh, cell phones are, but we've also had to come to realize that the technologies that we create can also be used in ways that are less responsible. So my sense is that we are going to have to think quite carefully um, around this. Um, yeah, I, I don't have enough expertise to know how one creates algorithms uh, and these uh, kinds of things, but some of the research that I am seeing uh, coming out, particularly in, in, the, in the sort of uh, social sciences and humanities, is questioning the ways in which they are. For example, in, in banking algorithms, who gets automatically approved uh, for a loan and who has to provide additional documentation or, you know, uh, extra information? Now, to me, that says there's someone sitting behind there who has some kind of bias about who is creditworthy and who is not either expressed or unknown, and they, they develop that into a system, whether it's a committee or an individual. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, that, that I'm thinking about is we have these technologies. In principle, they should be morally neutral, uh, but, but we do have to think about the ways in which we and the problems that we grapple with might shape or misshape them. Very well said. Michael, uh, would you like to add uh, yes, half a minute uh, or a minute to that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, there's something we should uh, understand. When we look at AI, it's a technique. We said it's a technique that mimic, it mimics human intelligence. Though in some cases now, we we'll find them to even perform better than the way we think. But we still need to control that because we are the one, they are mimicking us and we've gotten this, I would say, uh, very fantastic and even our superb uh, intelligence compared to them. We made them, we wrote the, 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 the algorithm that they are following with all the data. So it is very important that we look into that responsible uh, usage of this AI. And another thing that is quite very important, we all know that well, it has come to stay. There's no doubt about that. Even now, when it comes to research articles, you are even allowed to cite a portion of what chat GPT has written for you to say, uh, open AI, so, 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 wrote this part, it's allowed. So, which means uh, I will call on the government of South Africa. Maybe we can have artificial intelligence institutes in South Africa that would develop that responsible capacity I put it responsible. We can develop capacity without being responsible, but we want capacity developed for responsible use of artificial intelligence. And that's what we need as we progress on this. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. And lastly to you, Lennox, if you uh, if you have one or two closing uh, comments on that. I'll just say a last, last word. I think you spoke about existential threat. Is that is that correct? Um, so that might be referring to Jeffrey Hinton's recently, the godfather of AI resigning from um, Google and so on. And, and he's quite concerned about, uh, you know, the idea that um, AI is very quickly becoming more intelligent than, than humans. And that's the existential threat he, he is concerned about. Because it says if a less intelligent being is trying to control a more intelligent being, it's bound to go wrong. You know, and he's actually very concerned about the idea that AI could become a threat to humanity. You know, so I don't know about all that. I don't know enough about it. I just watched the YouTube videos, but I think in terms of a, a academy at this stage, there's a very nice resource that all of us um, should maybe have a look at. It's the sentient syllabus. Sentient syllabus. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to everybody, everybody um, we can put, put it maybe in the post, but it's uh, developed by academics and it really, um, it, it's a global academic attempt to kind of pin uh, what they would call the three prin principles of AI in, the, in academia. And it really focuses on three points, quality, truth, and collaboration. 
uh, in terms of quality, the, the, the point that AI cannot and should not be able to pass a course or, or pass a research paper or, you know. Uh, secondly, truth, AI contributions, contributions must all be attributed and must be fact-checked and must be true. And in collaboration using AI, you know, AI use must be transparent. And I think there's an opportunity here for all of us, cross-disciplinary opportunity, cross-faculty opportunity, cross-university opportunity. We're all sitting with the same problems in terms of AI. It goes across all these boundaries. Perhaps this could be something that we could use a lot, utilize to improve uh, that kind of interaction, collaborative action. So if I can just close off very quickly by um, by mixing in a couple of my own comments and, and summarizing some of the, the thought leadership that we've heard uh, this afternoon. Um, and you will find this back in the chat for those of you that are in the Teams chat. I think one of the most important things um, also relating to what uh, what Walter said in particular is that we do need to find our, our new place in the knowledge chain. This applies, of course, to, uh, to all humans. Uh, identifying what our knowledge um, add is. So in other words, the, the fact that ChatGPT is overrunning certain kinds of jobs may actually mean that those are just jobs that are, are not really suitable for um, uh, for humans doing, and we can uh, we can up our own game as humans to uh, to do something at a a further point in the food chain. Uh, explainable artificial intelligence is one of the key things. This connects, of course, to what uh, both Dion and uh, and Michael said. It's something that is mandated in places like the European Union. Uh, it's a very very difficult technical problem to crack, and um, several of us are working on it, but um, not really to uh, uh, to much success yet. And, um, and then lastly, I would say that um, a kind of counterpoint uh, or related point to what Walter said is that things like copyright and identity are dying concepts. Um, so we, of course, you know, in one sense, need updated copyright for the outputs of ChatGPT. But the fact that uh, generative AIs are swallowing large amounts of text and uh, subtly manipulating them and regurgitating them, in a sense, means that copyright owners uh, are getting next to zero value out of their copyright and uh, stemming that is going to be a very difficult problem indeed. And the same thing goes for deep fakes and, uh, and various other things that are related to generative AI. The notion that you can actually see someone on video or see a photo and trust this is a notion of or a proxy for identity, that's something that's essentially gone as well. Um, so at that, I'd like to then close off the panel, thank the panelists very much. Thank you for your patience um, and for me dropping in and out of video. Um, and I'll hand it back to you, Saviva. Thanks. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Claude. Uh, yes, uh, all what is left now uh, is for me to just quickly do a vote of thanks. Uh, I must indicate that I didn't uh, ask for the assistance of ChatGPT in preparing this one. Uh, I wanted to be as personal as possible. Um, I just want to express our sincere gratitude to all the speakers and uh, panelists who generously uh, shared their time, expertise, uh, expertise, uh, perspectives, advice, and words of wisdom with us today. Um, for many of us, AI remains a mystery that we have yet to fully comprehend and embrace. Uh, from your perspectives during the panel discussion, I hope we can find ways to seamlessly use these technologies in a positive manner for better and sustainable human development. I think I speak for everybody this evening in expressing our sincere gratitude to all the panelists and Professor Watson for his expert steering of the conversation. I extend my heartfelt thanks to Professor Moyo for always standing with us in support of our endeavors as the library. Your presence here has elevated the stature of, of this event as well as the discussions. We are truly indebted to you, ma'am, uh, for your support and leadership. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Ellen Tice for her leadership and support. Without her backing, Library Research Week 2023 would not have come to fruition. From the depths of my heart, I want to extend my sincere thanks to my fellow Library Research Week 2023 committee members for their unwavering dedication and contributions to the access, success of this event and the overall organization of Library Research Week. I would like to provide uh, special uh, recognition to Mr. Gekna, Van Defender, seated there, and Mr. Boter in front here, 
and the entire library IT team for their technical support before and during today's event. To all the members of the audience, we always value your support and we are fully aware that without you, this launch would not have been a success. Please continue to support us by attending sessions from tomorrow until Friday. Please feel free to provide us with feedback on how we can uh, improve our service to you. Um, at this moment, I would like to invite our in-person guests to join us for a reception at the library staff room. To our online audience, we apologize for your absence, but please know that you are in our thoughts. I wish you all a good evening. Thank you.